Steve. I, I just also want to put something on the table. I'm so, so pleased Arif's here, but I, I also want to say the United States government needs to validate the American Muslim community more by getting more uh, senior American Muslims into positions of responsibility. I was thrilled that Kofor just shared something I didn't know uh, about the initial uh, reactions and, and the special operations forces that went in after 9-11. Because I can tell you the reality in Washington is that people, particularly in political jobs, often run scared of appointing people who are American Muslims. Uh, there was a case during the campaign where, where Barack Obama uh, and his team basically let themselves go of a young lawyer named Mazen Asbahi in Chicago because he'd served on a board eight years ago with the Islamic equivalent of Jeremiah Wright. And, and when you talk to Jim Zogby or the Arab American Institute crowd, you can find these, these families that, that will have a black sheep or like any other family in there, but there is a uh, taboo and there is a, there, there is a bit of uh, uh, concern and I think it's just one of the things I just think that we as a society need to neutralize this stigma about it. It shouldn't be a big deal and I'm glad you're here, but it should be a non-issue that in fact you're, you're the highest ranking Muslim or Zal Khalilzad when he was in that position in the Bush administration. There ought to be a hundred more and and it is not the case today, and it's not the case because there are concerted campaigns against people because of that if they are whispered about for senior government positions. Mm. Friend. Yeah, I, was, I agreed completely with Steve. I, I was going to go back to Arif's uh, statement when you asked about empowering communities. One of the best programs in the country in terms of empowering and making it easy for people to support uh, local efforts is in Los Angeles. And uh, C then Commissioner Bratton of the LAPD, formerly of New York, um, started this whole campaign about sp suspicious activity reports and literally made it mobile. And so you see something that's suspicious or doesn't seem right, and you text it. I mean, you could hardly make it easier. You could hardly better empower a population in a community to feel like they have an individual responsibility. It don't, does not going to take them any extra time. Um, and make it easy for them to support local efforts. And it's those sorts of things that I think really make a difference and make, allow people to feel that they're contributing. Mm. Ambassador Black, you, you've mostly worked, or you've mostly been oriented towards the abroad, but do you have any ideas for how to empower American Muslim communities against terrorism? Well, again, my experience is that uh, my country's response after 9-11 was really the people who did the heavy lifting spearheaded were uh, American Muslims, you know, they have commonality, they had military experience, had fluency in language, and uh, they, you know, my, my personal experience is they were as, as enraged as all of us and uh, went out to defend their people and their country. Um, I do think that we have uh, an, a tremendous legacy here in the United States, which really is embracing, uh, that brings in people from all over the world. I think most of us believe that. This is our strength. If you're ever on a CIA team overseas, there's a Jew, an Arab, you know, I'm the sort of Irish Catholic. I mean, it's really a hodgepodge, mongrel kind of outfit, which is our strength. And I think every, everything that we can do to, to reassure the uh, Muslim community in the United States that not only they're equal partners, but we rely upon them very heavily, without which um, there would be extreme challenges us to, to compensate. Our first line of real defense in this is to make sure that we're all Americans and we stick with that program regardless of where we came from. And that will carry us through like it has in our past. Thank you. I, 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 I wanted to say to you first that, uh, that, that we have an audience full of people who are either extremely intelligent, extremely important, or in some cases both and uh, I'd like to spend the last 20 minutes uh, uh, opening to the audience. Please raise your hand. And we have one question here, and there will be someone with a microphone. Sagit, could you? And it would be very good if you said your name and if you're with any institution um, who you're affiliated with. And keep it brief. Thank you. My name is Gaudat Bahagat. I'm a professor at NISA. Mm -hmm. uh, my question is about American moral leadership if you are safe or unsafe after September 11th, it depends on our moral leadership. Mm -hmm. And my question is, uh, like, the young guy from Nigeria, his father reported him because he believed in American values. Uh, 
after September 11th, there are some questions about American moral leadership. What's your assessment? And also, uh, how good or bad America is winning the hearts and minds of Muslim people? Thank okay. you. We'll take this question. We'll bundle a few. Can I come to you in a second, Sebastian? I want to go to this half of the audience. Are there any questions here at all? Yes, there's a gentleman in the back here. Could you please stand up so people with the microphone can see you? Thank you. H Howard Clark, uh, Senior Analyst, Black Watch Global. My question is for, uh, I guess, all the panelists. Just uh, how um, much safer or less safe does the uh, U.S. and allied uh, NATO presence in Afghanistan and Iraq continue today to materialize the narrative of al-Qaeda of, of uh, Islam under attack? How much less or more safe does this make us today? And how much has that driven that homeland radicalization that you talked about? Thank you. And the third question goes to Sebastian here. Could you stand up so people with the microphone can see you? <laughs> Thank you, Peter. Dr. Sebastian Gorka, National Defense University, Irregular Warfare Department. This is for the whole panel, and you may recuse yourself, Mr. Ali Khan, if you'd like to. Um, until the Obama administration uh, issues its national counterterrorism strategy, if ever it does, we are left with the speeches of Mr. Brennan as guidance as to whether or not CT policy has changed with the elections. At his CSIS speech in August of last year, the speech focused on how CT has to be put back in its box. Counterterrorism has distorted US national and uh, security and foreign policy. Instead, the United States will focus on quote unquote upstream factors. And the speech went on to talk about what those upstream factors are. And again, quote unquote, the United States will lessen or ameliorate poverty and undereducation globally. I would like the panel to comment on if we can't even fix Afghanistan, how are we going to ameliorate <laughs> and lessen poverty and undereducation everywhere? Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much. I think we'll take one more question, and that's is, are there any? Uh, uh, females who want, oh, there's one, there's one. Please stand up, <laughs> Noreen. Um, please be recognized, yes, around please here be alone. recognized. Could, yes, thank you. thank you. Thank you, I'll do what I can for my kind. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Noreen Chowdhury Fink with the International Peace Institute. We're talking a lot about if we're safer from a 9-11 a type of attack and all, and we have discussed some of the failed plots, but I'd like to hear from the panel what you think maybe the next kind of attack could be, and what kind of threat we should envisage in terms of you know, staying safe from it. You said that criminals are one step ahead of the game. I'd like to know, are we one step ahead of the game here as well? Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. So those were four questions. I'd like to take Noreen's question at the very end because that's a good way of closing the panel almost. Um, but the first three questions were in some way all related. They were about American moral leadership abroad. They were about the narrative of Al-Qaeda and whether it is being strengthened by foreign entanglements, and whether America should make an effort to address the supposed root causes of terrorism that are meant to or said to be um, uh, under education, poverty, et cetera, et cetera. It, you know, as beautiful as that sounds, Steve, uh, realistically, America cannot solve all the, all the world's problems, right? Absolutely not. Um, I, I, uh think that the era we're in is, is remarkably like the era uh, in which Richard Nixon came into office, and, but, but worse. And what I mean by that is that, that Nixon, who wanted to be president in 1960, when the world still perceived the United States as in ascendance, Nixon came in in 1968 when American power was doubted, and American power looked constrained, and the job of the day was how do you try to preserve strategic assets and what you needed as essentially um, you were, we were engaged in a strategic contraction. We're in a Nixonian moment today, but simultaneously on the economic front in which there, I think, there are a lot of finance people here, but we're in, I think, wobbly ground. And I, and I think there's a broad global doubt in America's ability to achieve the things it says it's going to do.